Just a moment. Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone. I am hopefully you're able to hear me on the radio itself. Um, but good evening, everyone. I am here, Shirley, with Prison Break with Shirley, and I am so grateful to be here once again on tonight. And so, before we get started with anything, of course, I always want to give the disclaimer that the thoughts and views expressed on this show are those of the host, guests, and callers. They are not necessarily those of KRGN 98.5 FM, its management, or its sponsors and underwriters. KRGN 98.5 FM holds no responsibility of the validity or accuracy of the information on this show. I do want to thank my program managers, Mr. and Ms. Ron and Mimi Grace, and to our overseers of KRGN, um, Pastor and Lady Ronnie Gilchrist. Um, before we're getting started on the topic for tonight, I have I do have an announcement um, that Liberty Christian Center, which is one of the sponsors of KRGN, is sponsoring a community blood drive on Saturday, November 20th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and this will be the last donation site available um, on a weekend um, from now until the foreseeable future. So please take advantage of this one. It is going to occur on a Saturday. It's going to be held at 4107 West Cliff Road here in Colleen, Texas, and all are welcome and encouraged to donate blood. You do not have to be a member of Liberty Christian Center, but this is a community blood drive. You must be 17 years old and up with a valid ID to be able to participate, and you can register at bswblood.com and click on, the, click on schedule an appointment and find Liberty CC on the calendar for 11 dash 20. And if you have any problems signing up, you can always call me, Shirley, at 254-300-6027, and I will get you taken care of. Um, and I don't need any of your personal information for me to help you to get signed up. All right. And so prayerfully, that eases your mind. If you have any questions about anything, we will have an interview with um, Baylor Scott and White on next Monday. They're going to be out here. Um, and also, we're going to have a, um, a testimonial from um, someone who has had a real, real experience with the benefits of donated blood. And so that'll be next week, November 8th. Um, so stay tuned for that and make sure that you listen in. So before we get into anything else, I do want to go ahead and go into prayer. On tonight, we are continuing on this. I am continuing on a series um, called what are you fighting with? And this is part three, continue of breast, breastplate of righteousness. So Father, we come to you thanking you, God, for all that you are, God. Thank you for who you are, God. Thank you for being righteous, God. And thank you for being holy. Thank you, oh God, for being sovereign. Thank you for being loving and kind, God. Thank you, God, for um, allowing us, oh God, to come into this time, oh God, to the airwaves, God, and to um, Facebook Live and to anyone that should um, pay attention, God, either now or in the future, Lord God, on the replay, God, that you would touch the hearts, their hearts and their minds, God, even as you touch mine in my study of it, God. And so I just thank you, Lord God, for another opportunity to serve you, God, for to come before your people, Lord God. And I thank you, God, and I praise you and don't take this lightly. I got to just give you your name, the glory, oh God, the honor and the praise, God, that we will get something out of this lesson on tonight and how we don't have to be we don't have to be perfect because, God, you are. And because we are fitted with you, oh, God, we are. We can't be perfect in you. And so I thank you, God, and I praise you in your son Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So everyone that is um, tuned, tuned in by way of radio, thank you for joining me yet again on another segment of Prison Break with Shirley. If you have joined me by way of Facebook or on YouTube, thank you so much for joining in. And I do appreciate each and every single one of you. So again, we're continuing on the series of what are you fighting for, fighting with? And this is part number three, continued the breastplate of righteousness. So last week I talked about three types of righteousness. Number one was perfect righteousness. Number two was comparative righteousness. And number three was imputed righteousness. And so tonight, because I didn't get a chance to go really deep into any of those because you know we had an interview i had an interview on last week so my time was a little bit broken up but i'm going to get more into it on tonight so this hour will be power packed um i believe i am going to take up the whole hour to get through 
um, these types of righteousness. And um, tonight we're going, I'm going to go deeper into what those mean. And then I'm going to talk about the last type of righteousness. And so number four is practical righteousness. All right. So, of course, we've been studying Ephesians chapter six, um, going through verses 10 through 18. And so tonight I'm just going to hone in on verses 13 and 14 from the New Living Translation. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will stand, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. So I do know last week we talked about what it means, um, what the breastplate means and what righteousness means. And so the breastplate is that armor. It guards or protects the heart, uh, which I did say last week. It is the most important um, organ. The heart is the most important um, organ. If your heart is not beating, then guess what? You don't have a heartbeat and therefore you cannot live um, past a few minutes after your heart has stopped beating. If it has not been um, artificially restarted with some means, some some mode of cardiovascular interception, then you will not live very long um, past your heart stopping. And so we also know that our spiritual heart, it is the centerpiece of our soul. And that soul is also translated into the mind, the will, the emotions, and it has another part. It also holds our conscience which of which the Holy Spirit uses to allow God's children to hear his voice in our lives. Notice I said to allow God's children to hear his voice in our lives. There's a lot of noise going on in our heads, but what type of noise is it that's going on? We're going to come back to this portion, but I do want to drop this scripture for your hearing. Um, John chapter 10, verse 27, it says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. So what voice are you listening to? Is it the voice of the Holy Spirit or is it some other voice that is um, has taken over you and you believe that to be the Holy Spirit? Um, listening to our own conscious mind, if we are not um, if we are not a believer, can cause us to be in much trouble. I'm going to kind of glance over that and so we can get into the meat of this matter. But there is so much to be said about that as well. So the definition of righteousness, righteousness is upright living that aligns with the expectations of God. We cannot do this. We can't be righteous on our own, but we were given an advocate in the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter one, verses 13 and 14 tells us, and now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. I remember doing a segment. This was probably, I would say, probably about two years ago now. I've been on the air for, um, wow, it'll be three years in February. So I'm thinking it's been about a year, two, two, two and a half years when I did this segment and it was talking about, you know, the spirit and um, staying woke, I think that was the, the title of it, staying woke and um, what that really means and how different spirits, we allow those things to um, to be in our ear and we get off course and we think it's the Holy Spirit. But no, it's the spirit. All right. But it is there's nothing holy to that. And so if you would like to go back to that, go, go back to that um that series that I taught, that was, like I said, that was probably about two, two and a half years ago. Um, but what are the expectations of God? They are found in the word, the truth. So have to always, so we have to always have on the belt of truth. The Roman armor was made in such a way that the breastplate rested on the belt to take some of the weight off of the shoulders. And in this same way, the belt of truth carries the weight of our pursuit of righteousness. If y'all give me just a second, I forgot to do one thing um, to share this live on the KRGN page. So forgive me. I 
All right, done. All right. We have to know that righteousness is not perfection. We can never be perfect. That is why it's important to keep on the breastplate that we were gifted, right? We were gifted by the Holy Spirit when we believed on him. Ephesians chapter four, verse 30 says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And that's in the um, King James Version. But the NLT goes a little further to say it this way. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 has already told us that we received the Holy Spirit when we believed and he sealed us on that day. So then it is possible to be a believer or to be saved depending on your upbringing, but to be in error. The Holy Spirit did not leave and he wants to leave, but we have taken over the driver's seat. Just like when we have children, no matter what they do, how they behave, no matter what they may say to us, if they may go astray, they still have our DNA. It does not matter where they go. They are still a part of us. There is no way around it. And you don't disown them, do you? I really, really do hope that you don't because they are yours regardless of what they do. It is the same way in the spiritual realm. God does not disown us. We at times stray from him, but he is waiting with open arms, just, at the, at, just like the prodigal son's father. He welcomed him with open arms, even though the son was wrong in what he did, he still welcomed him home. Not only did he welcome him home, he didn't welcome him back as a slave. He welcomed him back as a son and threw a party for him. And that's the same way God wants to do for us. He doesn't want us to be discarded. He just wants us to come home. Last week, I talked about the heart and how the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 in the NLT, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. This is certainly true, my friends. Um, everything stems from your heart. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. To make it personal, God is looking at my heart. God is looking at your heart. This is how it is with wearing the breastplate of righteousness. We have to take these things personal, like looking at everybody else and seeing what they're doing, but we have to take a personal account. And so that's what this lesson on this week and last week did for me. It made me take a personal account of the things that I say, of the things that I do, my attitudes at times, because yes, at, at times I do have them. But it take, made me take a look at myself, not seeing what other people were doing or what they were saying or where they were going, but to really take a personal account. And I'm so grateful to the Holy Spirit for, you know, for convicting me and making me um, have a sense to where I want to get it right, to go back to my brother, to my sister, and to apologize, to get it right with them. The truth is the standard, like we talked about last week. The truth is the standard and righteousness is upright living that aligns with God's expectations. The devil will target us in the areas that are left unguarded. He is watching us, right? He is watching us to see our study habits. He's watching us to see how we react to situations. He is watching us to see our attitudes about things. And when we leave those things unguarded, he is going to target those areas. And so last month, um, Sometime in the series, I talked about our core. I talked about how our core and how when our core is not strengthened, then our bodies are weak. The rest of us cannot function the way that we were built to function. And so I'm going to go um, to this portion. So when he targets us, when the enemy targets us, he targets those things that, again, are not guarded. When our mind, when our will, when our emotions are off focus from God, we will sabotage ourselves. The devil doesn't even need, need to do that. We sabotage ourselves and we allow, begin to allow immorality in our own lives. So that's what the devil will target. That's what he's going to attack. Once he's done that 
If we do not have our core intact, we will essentially destroy ourselves. Depression, anxiety, you know, feelings of worthlessness. All, all that Satan needs to do is plant the seed there. And once that seed is there, we will begin to water the, our own seed, right? By the things that we say, by the things that we're reading, by the music, the sad, sad songs that we're listening to. Those things take root in us. And so I would admonish you on today, if you're feeling some kind of way and you don't know where those feelings are coming from, if you don't know um, why you're feeling sad or you're feeling angry, I want you to take stock of why you may be feeling that way and grab it by the root and to destroy it before it destroys you. Again, the enemy does not need to go all the way with you. He just needs to get a foothold in and we allow it to become a stronghold. So I'm going to go on over to our to the types of righteousness. Like I said last week, that first type of righteousness is perfect righteousness. Have you ever met a perfectionist? Somebody who goes in circles and they want to make sure that every single thing is correct before they get started. It causes anxiety in different things to know um, that a little hair is out of place or that the table, the table is a little bit, you know, lopsided or whatever the case may be. So I'm making light of, you know, just the just the small things. But the perfectionist is somebody who has to have everything has to be in order before they'll start anything. Everything has to be dressed right, dress. And sometimes that can cause fear in us and cause stagnation. It will cause us to be halted in ourselves because we're depending on us to do it not on God, who is the perfect one. Perfectionism is exhausting and it still doesn't make us right, right? It still does not make us right. So how about that? We, we can't be right in ourselves. And so I wanna go um, over to um, an example in the word where it talks about how someone was trying to um, change the standard, change God's standard to what he wanted for them, how he wanted things to go. And so as I'm turning there, um, I want you to want you to, you know, examine yourself. Are you one of the people that fits into the, the realm of perfectionism? I can truly say that I was one of those people um, before God allowed me to see me and for me to realize that I can't be perfect. I can never be perfect. You can never be perfect, no matter how we try. And so when I say that perfectionism can be exhausting, I mean that from a personal experience standpoint, that we cannot do enough to we cannot do enough to make everything so that it is perfect all the time. And so I am gonna go over to first Kings chapter 12, verses 25 to 33. And I thought that I had already thought that I put this in my um in my notes. So give me a moment to turn there for your hearing. All right. First Kings chapter 12, verses 25 to 33. Jero Jeroboam then built up the city of Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and it became his capital. Later, he went and built up the town of Peniel. Jeroboam thought of himself. Unless I am careful, the kingdom will return to the dynasty of David. When these people go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord, they will again give their allegiance to King Reboam. Forgive me for these names. I can never pronounce them correctly, but it's okay. King Reboam of Judah. They will kill me and make him their king instead. So on the advice of his elders, people speaking in his ear, the king made two gold calves. He said to the people, it is too much trouble for you to worship in Jerusalem. So he's making up his own rules. Look, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. He placed these calf idols in Bethel and in Dan at either end of his kingdom. But this became a great sin for the people worshiped the idols traveling as far north as Dan to worship the, the one there. Jeroboam also erected buildings at the pagan shrines and ordained priests from the common people, those who were not from the priestly tribe of Levi. And Jeroboam instituted a religious festival in Bethel. 
held on the 15th day of the eighth month in imitation of the annual festival of shelters in Judah. There at Bethel, he himself offered sacrifices to the calves he had made, and he appointed priests for the pagan shrines he had made. So on the 15th day of the eighth month, a day that he himself had designated, Jeroboam offered sacrifices on the altar of Bethel. He instituted a religious festival for Israel, and he went up to the altar, up to the altar to burn incense. Now, this is truly an example of someone who is doing it his own way and trying to, he did, you know, change the standard so that um, he changed God's standard, altered God's standard so that he could get his way. And what was his way? For the kingdom not to return back to the household of David. But in the end, as you heard, um, God's way still prevailed. Just like on today, we can alter things as much as we want to try to. We can put other things into existence to go against God's way. But in the end, God's will will prevail in our lives. Perfectionism can be rooted in the desire to get God's approval or to get approval or recognition from others. So I want you to take a look at this in yourself and see if you can pinpoint any of this in your own life. This is not to be condescending. This is not to be something that's pointing a finger at anyone. I have my own faults, right? I have my own things, my own perils that I have fallen into in times past and even now because I'm not perfect, right? But I know the one who is. And so I'm so thankful again for this word to be able to correct and to turn around some things that I may not have noticed in the past, but I'm well aware of them now. So take a look at yourself and see if you find any of these things in your life. Know that you are already approved by God and you do not have to try to be perfect because you can, no matter how hard you try. Romans chapter three, verses 10 through 12, as the scripture says, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. And Isaiah 64 and 6 says, we are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. So these verses help us to understand that we are all imperfect people and unable to be righteous on our own account. But, you know, that so that first way of being perfect is not what Paul was talking about in Scripture, because we cannot be perfect. So I want you to toss out perfect righteousness, right? Because that's not a good kind of righteousness. Number two, the second type of righteousness is comparative righteousness. Last week, I gave you the story of David and King Saul. Um, they had a little debunkle, right? They had this feud that was going on in 1 Samuel chapter 24. And as I was telling you last week, how they were comparing their individual righteousness, right? So the king, so this is King Saul. He took 3,000 men to search for one man. First of all, that's crazy, right? That you would take so many people to hunt for one person instead of going person to person, man to man, woman to woman, and to work out that situation. But you take your posse with you to uh, try to overthrow the other person. And so that was what was happening in this particular situation. The king took 3,000 men to search for one man, David, who not coincidentally, because we know that there are no coincidences in God, right? He was, he was hiding in the very cave that the king entered to use the bathroom. And so David and his men were in the cave and they were hiding out and they were in the dark. Nobody saw them. The king comes in. He comes to, you know, to relieve himself. And I'm kind of paraphrasing because I don't have time to go through um, this whole entire chapter. But it is in first Kings chapter 24, 1 Samuel, I'm sorry, chapter 24. David's men encourage him to kill the king right there. And everybody, he surely could have. The king didn't know he was there. His, he was um, he was facing towards the front of the cave. And so his back was out. Right. His back was turned. His armor was not protecting him right at this point um, because his back was turned. And so David surely could have killed him in that moment. So he did not he didn't kill the king, but he cut off a piece of his robe. 
basically letting him know, hey, I could have killed you, but I didn't. You know, his reasoning was still arrogance in, in my opinion, because he did not need to do any of that. All he needed to do was let God handle it. He didn't have to prove a point to anyone, right? But we do that today too, right? We do things because other people are watching us and we want to make we want to appear holier than thou or we want to appear that we're better than other people or that we have done everything so right. But I want to let you know that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect. None of us do everything right. We sin every day by the things that we say and not only sometimes by the things that we say, but the thought that we think that we did not correct when we were thinking it. Think about that. I will point out to you, though, that in verse five, the word says that his consciousness, remember I told you what the consciousness was, it is a part of the soul and how the Holy Spirit speaks to, and it is how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Um, it began to bother him about cutting the robe, and he held off his men from killing the king and repented of what he had done. And so even though he had a, a not right moment at the time, he was able to be humble enough to allow the Holy Spirit to correct him right in his dealings, to correct him in the deed that he did. So it is possible for us to have a change of heart, but we have to be willing to surrender our ways to God. In verse 16 and 17, it shows King Saul's response. He was grateful to David for not killing him. And then he realized that David was the one for the kingship. King Saul compared his righteousness to David's righteousness, saying that he was a better man than he was. And so that is where the comparative righteousness comes in at that um, he felt like, you know, if given the same situation, if, if King Saul were in the similar situation and David's back were turned and he had that opportunity to go ahead and kill David, he would have done so. But because David chose not to kill him in his vulnerable state, he cried, right? And he thanked him for not um, killing him, He had for having mercy on him. And so many a times, I know that we do, we compare ourselves to others and we look down on ourselves because we don't quite measure up to them. But that's in our eyes. That's not what God said. He didn't say that we didn't measure up to anyone. He does not want us to, to compare ourselves to other people. Comparative righteousness is not true righteousness because no one can adhere to God's perfect standard. This is a quote from Armor of God by Priscilla Shire. So even if your or another's actions are better than someone else's, they're still not as good as God's. So the point I want to make here is that comparison is a trap, right? It is deceiving and what the devil uses in our lives to keep us looking at other people's lives instead of looking to God. Again, comparison is a trap. It is deceiving. And what the devil uses in our lives to keep us looking at other people's lives instead of looking to God. Either way, thinking ourselves better than others or thinking ourselves lower than other, others produces emotions or attitudes that are false. So what I want you to do is get back to focusing on God. I've had moments when I've lost my way had moments where I thought that, you know, this is pointless, this is useless, but I know better, right? So I choose to focus on God, to get back to focusing on God and doing what he has called me to do, not looking at what other people are doing. I don't have a heaven or hell to put anybody in. You know, I don't have the calling that other people have and they don't have the one that I have. And so I have to do my part. You have to do your part in the kingdom, right? So our righteousness, again, is as filthy rags. We can't do it on our own. We can't behave right on our own. We can't, um, we just cannot be right on our own. And so I'm going to read to you in Romans chapter seven, what Paul says about that a little bit later, but I don't want to skip ahead. I want to make sure that I hit on the things for the next portion of our lesson, which is imputed righteousness. And I want to make sure that I didn't forget anything I want to talk about, about comparative righteousness. So let me um, take a moment to go back and look. And I'm telling y'all, if y'all have don't have this, this study um, lesson, you need to get it. It's a personal, personal thing that 
can really, really help us along the way as believers to really self-examine ourselves, not looking at anyone else, but to really to really examine um, our lives and to come clean before God and to walk in his way. So, of course, we don't need to, you know, compare ourselves to anyone. You know, our comparison should be the standard of God. Are we living to that, what he has called us to do and to be? But remembering that we cannot be perfect in Christ. We are made perfect because we are simply because we are in Christ. There are things that make us feel sometimes some kind of way when we judge others, right? When we look at ourselves as better, you know, than some other people. Sometimes we can feel superior. Sometimes we feel justified in our actions. Sometimes we are proud, right? And pride comes before a fall. That's what the word says. We can feel accomplished, mature, smart, or confident. All of those things are things that we may feel when we measure ourselves as better than other people. But I can tell you, it is not the righteousness of God. And on the flip side, when we think that we're worse off than other people, there are some things that can come along with that. Depression, right? Feeling inferior, feeling weak, feeling ignorant, resigned, embarrassed, or regretful. And that is not the will of the Father for us to feel those types of things either. He doesn't want us to be depressed. He doesn't want us to be anxious. He doesn't want us to feel less than. So throw all that away. Give it to God. Place it at his feet and allow him to restore you on this evening. So remembering that we cannot be perfect, right? And we cannot compare ourselves to each other because none of us are right. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, none of us are right. And even with the Holy Spirit, we are subject to error because it is a day by day thing. We'll, and I'm going to get into that because that's a part of a ladder type of righteousness. So number three is imputed righteousness. Imputed um, means that it is credited. Jesus came to give us imputed righteousness. This came when Jesus paid the death penalty for us. He paid it for us on the cross and he did that one time, once and for all. He did that. He didn't need to keep going back and dying again for us over and over again. It's a done deal, right? And I'm so grateful for that, that we don't have to do it. He took on the sins of the world. He took on our sins and he died, he put those, those things to death and buried them for us. So imputed righteousness is what God has done for us. And it is a one-time deal. Genesis 15 and 6 says that Abraham was counted, counted as righteous because he believed by faith. It wasn't that he was so right. Romans chapter 4, verse 22 to 24 says, And because of Abraham's, Abraham's right faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, he wasn't just, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too. Aren't you so glad about that? It was for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus, our Lord from the dead. So we get credit because we believe nothing more, nothing less. This is such good news because again, we can't do it by ourselves. Jesus already did it. He already paid the price for us. So we don't have to take on the sins of the world. We don't have to take on our sins of yesterday. We don't have to take on our sins of today. Place it at his, at his feet in repentance and knowing that he has forgiven you already. So we get credit. Again, we get credit for those things simply because we believe. Do you believe? Do you believe on today? I hope that your answer is yes that you believe in God. You believe that he sent his only begotten son to die for your and my sins and that he was raised on the third day and that he has all power in his hands. I hope that you believe that. So God credited to him as righteous and not only to him, but to us. He credited it to us as righteousness simply because we believe, right? So take off the onus from yourself, right? Take off, you know, the responsibility of feeling like you got to do it on your own because you don't. Amen, Sister Julia. Thank you for your response. Um, and so it, it's a great thing to know that, again, we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to compare ourselves to one another and that we are imputed as righteousness simply because we believe. So perfect righteousness, it discourages you, right? Comparative righteousness it deceives you, 
but imputed righteousness, it defines you and declares you innocent before all of your accusers. That is an awesome thing right there. You have to see yourself as righteous. If you believe the Lord, I want you to repeat after me, wherever you are, whether you're driving in your car, whether you are um, eating dinner with your family, whether you are, you know, wherever it is, maybe you're still at the job. Just repeat after me. If you believe the Lord, I am righteous. Put your hand on your chest. Say, I am righteous. Guess what? It's a done deal. Now you can wear your breastplate. The breastplate covers your heart. It guards your heart so that those strikes against you, they're going to fall to the ground. They can't eat you alive. They, they can't do anything. They may cause a small scar. But guess what? When the heart is guarded, you don't have to worry about being devoured because all you have on your breastplate and it's going to cover all of your major organs. Right. So we know under y'all know I'm a nurse. So sometimes I go back into, you know, things of the body, which all equates back to the spirit. Right. We are we are not um, body by ourselves and we are not spirit by ourselves. You know, and so we know that that breastplate covers all of your torso, your heart, right, is on your left hand side. And you've got your lungs are on your left and your right, still under the breastplate, right? You've got your rib cage, which encompasses or protects, you know, the, the, the organs of your body, the major portions of your body. Your liver is housed under there. Your small intestine is being covered by the breastplate. Your large intestine is being covered by the breastplate. If you don't have your armor on in the natural and you get a wound in any of those errors, you are subject to bleed out. You are subject to die from loss of blood, right? You are subject to loss of blood. And so we have to protect our vital organs. We have to have on our breastplate as believers in Christ. Do we get off sometimes? Absolutely. But there are ways that we can get back on track. You are righteous. Say, I am righteous, right? So our last um, portion of um, righteousness, our last description of righteousness is practical righteousness. We got to know that we can, we've already been credited with righteousness. So we don't have to be perfect. Y'all notice I keep on repeating this because it is worth hearing. It is worth listening to. It is worth absorbing into your spirit so that you can understand that Jesus died for you. You don't have to do all this on your own, but that's why he came for us, right? We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to compare ourselves. I promise you, if you if we get this right, then we'll see depression lift off of us. We will see, you know, the, the attitudes and the perils to lift off of us. Doesn't mean that we're not going to go through anything because Definitely we are. And that is so why it's so important for us to have on the whole armor of God in these trying times. It is important for us to have on our full armor. You're already righteous. So next time the enemy comes up to you and he comes to to throw you off of what God told you to do. Make sure before you say anything, before you do anything that you have checked to make sure that you have put on what needs to be put on. And we'll know, we'll know by the answer that we give, right? By the response that we give of whether our breastplate of righteousness is fully on or whether there's a crack in it. I have in I have at times recently found some cracks in my armor, but I have I'm thankful to God that he allows me the opportunity to get it right. So how many of you know that any time or or any preacher, you know, who comes in and brings a word, it is first to them, right? Anybody who comes to minister, the word is first and foremost to them before they can give it out. Because we are all, we, he, we're just vessels that he uses. We're just people that he uses to, to um, impart truth into the earth. Not that we have it all together. We certainly don't. I know I don't have it all together. But I'm so thankful that he allows us to continue on this journey. So I am righteous. You are righteousness simply because you believe nothing more and nothing less. You are righteous. I hope you believe that on tonight, that you are righteous. If you have believed on Christ Jesus, who died for your sins, you are righteous. And lastly, number four, practical righteousness. We need to go one step further after we have been imputed as righteous. And that is practical righteous, righteousness. So normally we say, right, that practice makes perfect. 
And a lot of times we do believe that, right? And so, you know, we we go round and round and you go to piano lessons or, you know, football practice or, you know, whatever the practice may be, singing, you know, choir rehearsal, um, excuse me, in effort to hit every note, right? To make sure that there are no um, mishaps during the performance, because that's what it is, right? It is a performance. And so for most things that this is very needful that we practice. But in this case, we cannot achieve righteousness by practicing, right? Because that goes back to perfectionism, which is perfect righteousness, which is what we cannot do. So, right. So you see that that continuous cycle, it goes back and forth. And so with practical righteousness, we have to allow perfect to make practice, if that makes sense to you. So we daily have to put off things and put on some other things. And this is how we are able to practice practical righteousness. And so I'm going to go over to Ephesians chapter four, verse 22 to 24. And I'm going to read that for your hearing. So we will know how we are able to have practical righteousness. I have it in another translation here, but I didn't want to read it quite, read it out of that translation. So I am going to go back to the New Living Translation. And so I say it, Ephesians chapter four, verses um, 22 to 24. And the word of the Lord reads, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Some things we need to put off. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. So I read through um, verse 27. Don't let the enemy get any room. And I'm actually going to read, keep on reading down through um, verses 30, verse 31. Uh, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Verse 28, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Ouch and amen, because I know sometimes I can have one of those tongues that are cutting. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of the redemption. And verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, hard words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other. I'm going to read that, read that a little later because I didn't want to jump ahead. Sorry. Verse 31. Right? So we need to put off some things and put on some other things so that we can um, have practical righteousness. So the things that we need to do, right? Stop telling lies. So verse 26 tells us to stop telling lies. Verse 20, 25 says to stop telling lies. Verse 26 says, don't let anger control you. Um, verse 28 says, quit stealing. Verse 29 says, don't use foul or abusive language. And y'all, you know, sometimes that's not, that's not even curse words. That doesn't even have to be curse words. But that could be you're stupid. You don't know nothing. You know, um, the things, the things that we, we use, the words that we use to cut down others. Those are foul and abusive words as well. So it doesn't have to be the Strong's, you know, or the um, Webster's Dictionary definition of a curse word. So watching our mouth and verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, all types of evil behavior. And in chapter five, verses three through five, it goes on to explain to us um, some other things, sexual immorality, impurity, greed, obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. So I want you to go back into your word and I want you to identify some of those things that you may have gotten caught up in 
circle those things. I did it. I did it for myself. You know, things that I need to repent of, things that I need to do better at, things that I need to give over to God, because really that is the only way that we can change is by the Holy Spirit. Right. We cannot. Again, I will reiterate, we cannot do it on our own. So verses 22 to 24 tells us that we need to put off some things or take off some things and we need to put on other things. And so in verse 32, it tells us instead, be kind to each other tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Isn't that wonderful that God has already forgiven us? He's already forgiven us. And so why are we holding that over our heads? Why are we holding that against people um, that that we feel like we have to we have to do a certain thing to garner God's love? We don't. That we have to do a certain thing to to be righteous. We don't. God has already counted us as righteous. We don't have to seek for his approval. He already approved us when we believe. We've already been approved. And that's good news. We have to make a conscious decision, though, every single day um, that we are going to practice practical righteousness. So we've already been imputed once. And now every day we have to renew our minds, right, so that we can practice it every single day. Romans chapter 13 Verse 12, 13 and 12 reads, sorry, I'm trying to get my hair out of my face. <laughs> the night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothing and put on the shining armor of right living. Put on the shining armor of right living. And as I was going through some things on um, today, I was looking at some pictures of different um, pieces of armor that they may have worn back in the medieval times or, you know, just anything in the past. And I saw that, and I don't think I've ever, ever seen this before, but I saw some female armor. I saw some armor that was fitted for a woman. It had the cutouts for, you know, the, the breasts themselves. But even though it had the cutouts for breasts themselves, everyone's breasts are not the same size, right? So you still have to have a unique sizing for you. Just like David, he tried to put on the armor that others gave him, but that armor didn't fit him. He couldn't do what he needed to do with that armor because it was not his own. It was not what God gave him to do. He was good, right? With the slingshot and, and, and the rocks. So whatever God gives you to do and how he gives you to do it, that's the way that it should be done for you. It's not for anybody else. It is for you. So just like those, the armor was um, situated and designed for those particular for particular people, so our armor is garnered for us individually because we are unique in Christ, right? God didn't make any robots. He didn't. He didn't make us to be a mirrored image of anyone else. But He made us in His likeness and image, and so. That looks different for every single person. So wear the armor that you've been given. We all have the same general type of armor, right? But it is suited for us. In the military, they, they suit us. They, they give us, they size us for our individual helmets. They size us for our individual um, breastplates, if you will. But even still, they are made generic. So it doesn't fit everybody the way that it should, that the way that it needs to. So we have to get what God gives us, hone in on those gifts, hone on, on, hone in on the things that God has given us to do because he didn't give our vision to everybody. He gave it to us to carry out. And so we have to be guilty, if you will, of carrying out what he gives us to do. We can't blame it on somebody else. We can't say so-and-so didn't give me this or didn't give me that. So I'm just going to sit here. Um, well, we have to be big enough that we are going to humble ourselves and we are going to put on what God has given us to put on. And so when we make, we, we get imputed righteousness once, but practical righteousness is moment by moment. It is day by day. It's circumstance by circumstance. We get a choice every single moment of how we're going to react, right? To the situation, what we're going to say back to someone, or if we're going to be quiet, even though we could, have something to say. We might even be right, but we don't always have to have a rebuttal 
against the things that are said or done against us. We have a choice. When we make the choice to practice right, practical righteousness, we are able to block the schemes of the devil against our most valuable asset, which is our heart, right? How do we do that? Well, I want to go back to Romans chapter seven, um, and I'm not going to read it. I want you to go and I want you to study it for yourself. I do not have time to do that on tonight. But Romans chapter seven, it goes into detail. We know that what Romans was written by Paul, by Apostle Paul. And this goes into detail about the law, um, about sin. And Paul struggled with sin, even though he wanted to do good and to be good. He could not do it in and of himself. It is truly the same with us on today. We cannot be righteous in and of ourselves. It takes the willing work of the Holy Spirit to empower us. And that can only happen, right, when we allow him to take his place, when we humble ourselves before God. He does not and will not force righteousness on us. It is an every day, every moment, every circumstance decision that we have to make in and for ourselves. Then I told you that Ephesians 4 and 23 explains how, how to combat that sinful nature. It says, instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. There is a portion of scripture in um, Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 through 28, where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and how they, um, they thought they were righteous, right? They were doing things, you know, according to the law. They were putting other people down and they did things to be seen of other people. But Jesus, you know, he came to them and he corrected them. He let them know, you know, that you're, you're not right. This is this is not of me, basically, because he is he is God. He was God in, in in fleshly form at that moment, but still a deity, still perfect in all of his ways. Jesus was the only one that was perfect ever. And so in your spare time, read Matthew chapter 23, um, chapter 30, 23, verses 25 to 28. And you can see those things that we ought not do, that we should not do things that we shouldn't say, you know, not to be a Pharisee. And there are many um, modern day Pharisees and we don't may, we may not see it that way, but there are many modern day Pharisees. Changes come by spiritual growth, reading his word, meditating on it by prayer and by fasting. These will result in a changed life. These will result in practical righteousness. Don't seek the stuff, seek God. This is this is everything of what Matthew chapter six, verse 33 is talking about. It says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. So when we humble ourselves and we when we study, when we do the things that we, we need to do, when we allow the Holy Spirit to convict us, right, in the things that we've said or done, when we allow him to use use us in for his glory, when we allow, you know, when we, we hear that that word, that the, the word of the Lord that will come back to us, right, when we recount something, he'll bring it back to our remembrance, you know, when that situation arises. When we allow him to have reign in our lives and to rule over us, when we seek his face first, then everything else you want, everything else you need, everything that you need, we may not get everything that we want. Let me rephrase that. We may not get everything that we want on this side of heaven, but we will get everything that we need. And he will give us some of our wants too. We don't have to live in lack. We don't have to live, you know, um, below, below, you know, but when we delight ourselves in him, he will give us the desires of our hearts. But you know why he said that? Because our desires of our hearts will line up with his will for our lives. Think about that. So it's been a pleasure. I know it's, it's been wonderful to, to go over this with you. So um, four types of righteousness. The first two are no good. What are they? They are perfect righteousness. They are comparative righteousness, number two. Number three is imputed righteousness, which we all have when we believed on Christ Jesus. And number four is practicing practical righteousness. And so there are things that we will, um, the unction of the Holy Spirit will give us when we start practicing practical righteousness, right? He will He will prompt us to say, I'm sorry, right? It will practice, he will prompt us to get it right with our neighbor, he will, he will prompt us to, to do the things that we need to do. These are the things that we can we should put on. 
that he will allow us to put on in Ephesians 4, 2 and 3. Um, he talks about humility and gentleness, patience, unity in the spirit and binding together in peace. And in verse 25, telling our neighbor the truth. In verse 32, being kind to each other, be tenderhearted, forgiving one another. When we put off those first things, the first set of qualities, and we put on the second set of qualities, he'll begin to work in us. And I don't want you to feel condemned. Again, if there's something in you that needs to be gotten right on tonight, tonight is the perfect time where we can do that where we can get back in right standing with God because there are circumstances of life that will cause us to become cold hearted, that will cause us to become bitter. Sometimes we don't even realize that the bitterness has crept up. I found a spot in myself that I know that I need to get right before God, um, not knowing that it was there, but God in his infinite wisdom allowed me to see that it was there. And so um, don't feel condemned, you know, but be convicted. There's a difference between feeling condemned and being convicted. Conviction allows us to get it right before the Father. Condemnation comes from Satan. And Satan wants us to feel condemned and, and put the onus on us. But really, the onus was on Jesus and he already took care of it for us. So know that you are righteous. You can allow the spirit to renew your thoughts and your attitudes. And you are righteous. You've already been counted as righteous when you believe. You can practice putting off the old and putting on the new daily. You can control your tongue. That is why the word tells us that the power of death, and you know, he says death first, the power of death and life are in the power of our tongue and we shall eat the fruit therein. That's what it means. Whatever we put out, it is coming back. And so have a positive attitude in God, right? Do what he requires of us to do in his way becomes much easier. God is how we can, how our situations can change. We cannot be perfect, but because Christ is, we can take on his nature, which makes us perfect. Perfect makes practice. Don't get caught up in trying to practice your way to an elusive state of perfection. Instead, flip the script and rely on the perfect nature of Christ in you to affect your practice every day single day. I pray that you've been blessed and that you've got something out of this. Father, we come to you. We thank you, God. We thank you so much for allowing us to study this on tonight together, that someone's heart will be changed on tonight. Someone will come to know you in the pardon of their sins. Someone will stop feeling condemned on tonight and will give the heaviness to you. You told us to cast our cares on you for you care for us. And so I thank you that you have already imputed us as righteous and you have already allowed us a way into the kingdom. And so I thank you, God, that your way is right, your way or no way. But I thank you, God, for a, a, a way of escape. I thank you for the opportunity, you know, that, that we can come back to you at any time and we can come to the Father and complete um, surrender unto you. And you're there with open arms. So Father, thank you for each and every person that is listening under the sound of my voice, God, who may be on Facebook Live or on YouTube, that they have given it to you. And I thank you and praise you in your son Jesus' name. So everybody, you have been listening to Prison Break with Shirley. My time is up. Next week, we're going to be talking about putting on peace. All right, y'all be blessed. The next voices that you are going to hear are Marriage Mondays with the Kings. Y'all be blessed. Keep it locked on 98.5 KRGN FM The Rock. All right. God bless you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on tonight. I pray that you've been encouraged on tonight. You can drop your comments, continue to drop your comments in the box. I'll read them later. Um, but thank you so much for tuning in on tonight. If there are any prayer requests um, that you would like me to, to pray with you on, or if you want to, whatever you want to do, I, I thank you for tuning in on tonight. Y'all be blessed. 
once and I continue to study, continue to go back through the notes, through the word that was given, not just this week, but the re weeks prior, if you missed any parts of those. I want to say October, um, the first um, the first Monday in October was the first lesson I did. It's been kind of kind of um, choppy, but you can you'll find the lessons. And again, next week we're going to be talking about um, peace, and we all need it, right? So y'all be blessed. I love you all, and we'll see each other on next week. All right, God bless.